Welcome to part two of our brief overview of the history of the Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Today we'll conclude some more of the historical questions, but also get into the history-making process and what it means for a church body to examine its own history. So having been on guard against unionism, especially, it's kind of what, not kind of, but it's really the cause of the, the new reorganized uh, synod, how did the ELS respond to troubling developments within the Synodical Conference's major player, the Missouri Synod, during the mid-20th century? What was happening in Missouri Synod was probably especially disconcerting to the Evangelical Lutheran Synod. In 1935 is when the American Lutheran Church issued an invitation to other Lutheran church bodies for formal discussions. Interestingly, the ELS was not included in that invitation list. But Missouri Synod and Wisconsin Synod declined the invitation. Missouri Synod accepted the invitation. And this was very troubling to the ELS in particular because while Missouri Synod was having discussions now with the ALC, the ALC was also having discussions with the Evangelical Lutheran Church, and that was the merger Norwegian church body. So Missouri Synod was having discussions and both with the Synodical Conference, they, they were a member, and with the church body that the ELS had come away from. And so this had the potential very much for a triangular type of relationship and fellowship between the synods themselves. It was, uh, it was Henry Ingebrigtsen, who was, I believe, president at the time, that said, because of the sad experience that we had during the merging of the Norwegian church bodies consummated in 1917, we have found it necessary to be alert watching closely present union deliberations carried on between the Missouri Synod and the ALC, which affects the whole Synodical Conference. And then he eventually goes on to say that the declaration that they had was unclear, misleading, giving no assurance of unity in the spirit. And he says, like Opior, it gives no assurance of the settlement of old controversies. And so for the ELS, it brought up all of those old memories but it also adopt, brought up to them the fact that it appears Missouri Synod is going down the same road. <laughs> and so the ELS and Wisconsin Synod both protested very much against those relationships that were developing with the American Lutheran Church and Missouri Synod. Of course, that ultimately for the ELS resulted in 1955 suspending fellowship with Missouri Synod. The ELS remained in the Synodical Conference until 61, and it was in 61 that Wisconsin Synod broke fellowship and also withdrew from the Synodical Conference. So how did these issues with the Missouri Synod affect the relationships with the Wisconsin Synod? I kind of got the impression from the book that maybe the ELS was a bit closer to Concordia, St. Louis, and the Missouri Synod. Would, would that be a fair assessment to say they were a little bit closer with Missouri than Wisconsin in those early years? Very, very much. The ELS and Missouri Synod were regarded as big sister and little synod. Big sister and little synod, rather. Their relationship had been very close since 1857 in the start of seminary training in St. Louis. And so shared a common friendship, shared a common terminology for theology. All of that was very, very common between the ELS and Missouri. And of course, after 1918, seminary students were trained until 47 in St. Louis, basically. And so the tie was very, very tight. The relationship between the ELS and Wisconsin Synod has been described as being more like cousins. It was a little bit farther away because there were not those close elements that bound them together. 
And so the distance was a little bit, or the relationship with Missouri was a little bit closer. And for the ELS, the break in fellowship was regarded really as being tantamount to the break in fellowship that had happened amongst the Norwegians in 1917. So it was very, very much so. But what was happening now in the 50s, in the 60s, and especially following, is with Wisconsin Synod, we saw the common cause that existed between us. We more directly had to lean upon one another, support one another, and realize we are promoting, pushing for the very same thing itself. At Wisconsin Seminary, I believe it's Paul Meitner wrote the paper, Strangers to Sisters. And that talks about the change that was taking place of the closer relationship between the ELS and Wisconsin Synod during those years. With the break in fellowship though, the ELS also lost several things. We had turned really to Concordia Publishing House for Sunday school materials, portals of prayer, daily devotions, Mission work had been through the Synodical Conference, primarily. And a big element was all of the Missouri Synod students attending Bethany Lutheran College. Those, the first of those were gone, basically. And having to turn to Wisconsin Synod, to Northwestern Publishing House. And so and after those years, rather than seeing items laying in church buildings saying Concordia Publishing House, they're now going to say Northwestern Publishing House. And so that became very, very much a tighter bond that took place between us. And of course, then shortly after that is the push that leads forward to the, the formation of the Evangelical Lutheran Confessional Forum between the ELS and Wisconsin Synod that meets every other year. And then the next step onward being the formation of the Confessional Evangelical Lutheran Conference, the CELC, which becomes our international church body. So the relationships grew tighter and tighter together. And it is nice that just geographically speaking, um, kind of right next door to centers uh, for institutions, we have uh, New Ulm, Minnesota, uh, and then in one county and right next door in Mankato, um, there you have uh, Bethany Lutheran College and Bethany Lutheran Seminary, uh, so close. I, I always thought that was kind of neat. Um, but you know what, when I was going to Martin Luther College, I never visited Bethany, and I, probably because I didn't have a car, that's my real excuse, but. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll use that as the excuse. <laughs> yeah, but I do know we had we had uh, people travel back and forth for presentations. That was very nice to have that um, convenience there. And of course, for sports, that's the big rivalry between the schools. Yeah. Now, I want to just bring up uh, the topic of missions and outreach. Uh, they've clearly played a very important role for the ELS or over the decades or this past century. Um, and the book itself, you have, is it four chapters, four or five chapters that cover various, was it three? Okay. Um, but a huge part of the book does cover that. Um, I don't think we'll have enough time today, unfortunately, to go into all the detail of all the mission work. Um, but could you share a bit about the importance of missions and outreach? The Senate, of course, was small. It became very, very important, not only as a part of the Great Commission, but for the future existence of the Synod itself. But at first, at the very beginning, there was a special need that the Synod faced. And so at its very first convention in 1918, they appointed two missionaries at large. And what their position was, was to reach out for those scattered individuals who had now been left homeless following the merger of 1917. And so they gathered small groups in various places and ministered to individuals who were scattered far and wide. One of these, for example, served a field that went from central North Dakota to eastern Wisconsin. And that was his traveling area. Another one from northern Minnesota 
to central Iowa. And so they covered a great deal of area in mission work. And that did lead to something quite unique that remains to this day in the ELS constitution. And that is members of the synod, or the synod is made up rather of congregations and pastors, and then in special circumstances of individuals. And so if an individual was all by himself somewhere in these early days, he want, there was no congregation, but he wanted to identify with the faith and practice of the ELS, the Old Norwegian Synod, he could be received into membership as an individual. And that is quite unique amongst Lutheran constitutions. But finally, formal mission work for home missions. The first formal home mission congregation was in 1926. Foreign mission work was through the Synodical Conference. And finally, the first independent work was in 1949. But it was really 1968 at the centennial that there got to be a blossoming of true foreign mission work with the mission field in Peru. That was always extremely important to the Synod, has now become a self-sufficient body. Eastern Europe, opportunities arose, and so the presence was seen there. In 2005, the ELS was asked to supervise work of the mission field in India. And that became extremely significant because the size of the mission field in India is larger than the size of the Evangelical Lutheran Synod. And then Eastern Europe work has continued more, Eastern Asian work rather, has continued more at the present point in time. And so that thrust of mission work has been dear to the hearts of the members of the Synod throughout. Now, we already mentioned briefly the, the educational institutions that were set up, Bethany Lutheran College and Bethany Lutheran Seminary. Can you tell us a bit uh, when they were started and why? Bethany Lutheran College is unique in that remember the ELS considers content, remember the ELS considers itself to be the continuation of the Norwegian Synod. Well the Norwegian Synod was eight years old when they established Luther College. Bethany Lutheran College came under the control of the ELS when we were nine years old. So you can see a parallel that takes place but more so a spot was needed for both identity and for training of our church members themselves. Bethany Lutheran College had been started already in 1911 as a school of members of the Synodical Conference, not sponsored directly by any synod, but as a Synodical Conference school. It was going through difficult times and so it was offered to the ELS for purchase. The ELS did not jump on it, but eventually took over the control, the operation, the ownership of the college in 1927. And at that time, Bethany became a co-educational co school. It is a liberal arts college and was from that point in time, so was not considered to be merely a pastor teacher training school but in Norwegian tradition was liberal arts. The seminary, Bethany Lutheran Seminary is observing its 75th anniversary this year. It was organized in 1946 and for a couple reasons. And one was, it was for our own identity. It was for our own needs that our own students needed to be trained knowing the needs of the ELS of these older Norwegian congregations themselves. And it was felt we could do that better on our own than relying upon especially Concordia St. Louis. But this was 1946 and concerns were developing of what was occurring within Missouri Synod with the Synodical Conference. And at that time already, we had a few students who were beginning to make use of Northwestern College and Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary. And so a natural shift was taking place away from St. Louis. 
And so the time became very opportune to establish our own seminary in Mankato. All right, and that 75th anniversary, are you doing anything uh, or is the, the Synod or seminary doing anything to commemorate that anniversary? We are one week away from our annual Synod convention. And so on Sunday, June 20th will be the official observance of the 75th anniversary of the seminary. It will be observed through the convention week in various ways. One of the things that will be happening is there will be three essayists by three professors at the seminaries and they will be presenting seminary education in the past, seminary education today, and what is important for seminary education in the future. There also will be a book that is being published and released at that point. It will be entitled, The Good Shepherd Sends Shepherds, and it is being produced as a, as a companion volume to proclaim his wonders. Well, what good timing. I'm glad That's we could, we're, we're able to announce that just on the eve of, of that anniversary uh, celebration. Now, the last, as you mentioned, the last history for the, the Synod came out at the 75th anniversary, and that was back in 1993. Uh, what has this book, uh, Proclaim His Wonders, been able to update? What, what were some of the major challenges and opportunities for the ELS since uh, that 75th anniversary? I would say there are two major things in particular. And one becomes uh, foreign mission work especially during the years when President John Molstead was serving in that office. And so that would be after 2001, 2005, whenever he was elected. But the foreign mission field expanded great, very greatly during those years. It was during those years that we expanded to supervise the mission work in India. In the following year in 2006, we expanded mission field into Korea. The mission field in Peru became an independent body at that point in time. And so the foreign mission work would be the greatest of the changes during those recent years. The other big thing that took place is the change at Bethany Lutheran College. And Bethany Lutheran College became a four-year baccalaureate granting institution. That happened with the first graduating class in 2001. Until that, it had been a junior college. And so that change meant a big change needed to take place both in the facility, with a lot of construction taking place in the college in Mankato, and also with faculty and a greatly enlarged faculty to incorporate the new baccalaureate program. And now just this month, the first classes began to offer the first master's degree. And so the changes primarily have been foreign missions and Bethany College. So kind of wrapping up our content of, of the book, uh, my questions were kind of giving our audience members just an outline of the identity of the ELS, how it got founded especially, um, but perhaps these questions don't really give a good feel for what the book is itself, because it is filled with hundreds of pictures and additional quotes and anecdotes. So before we move on to the, the final parts of the interview today, do you have a favorite picture or story from the book that you'd like to talk about? There's one picture in particular, and it's not a good print, it wasn't available, but there is a photo of President George Orvik, I believe it is the 1970 convention. Now remember, mission work began in Peru in 68. So this is brand new. And here there is a photograph of President Orvik, 1970, holding the telephone in one hand and a microphone in the other. And the story that goes with it is this is during the Synod Convention and how the Synod Convention was hushed. An international phone call was coming in from Peru. 1970, this is unheard for, unheard of. 
The phone call comes in, the assembly hall is hushed. Here are our missionaries. And that photo tells just a great, great deal of story, both the love of missions, the act of the president, and what time was like right there in that day and age in 1970. And that's just a wonderful, wonderful photo. Wish we'd have had a sharper image or a better one. It's acceptable, but a, a nicer one would have been even, even greater. But there's one other one that I wanna share with you because it's not a photo, but it's an image. We have the, the expense record of the 1925 Synod Convention. The expenses for the entire convention are listed at $860. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the list, you will the itemized list of items that were purchased, $67 was spent for cigars. It's a big percentage. <laughs> Nearly 10%. That also speaks of the day. And today in the age in which we live, that's one that makes us truly smile. Yeah. All right, well, thank you for sharing those, those uh, images. I hope people have the opportunity to look at the many more that are in the book. Our next section is now talking more about the history process. Uh, could you tell us a bit about how you went uh, through this process of researching and then writing this book? The, cent the Centennial Committee for the Synod was formed already in 19 or in 2010, and it was tasked with both observing the 2017 anniversary of the Reformation and the 2018 anniversary of the Synod. And that was quite far in advance. But already in 2013 is when I was asked to be the author and to compile this book itself. When actually, if anything, the time frame was tight from 19 or 2013 until it was distributed in 2017. But what was needed was this was a new writing of the history. It was not simply a repeating of what had gone before us, in part because of the pictorial basis. And so I wanted to go back to original sources. And so one of the elements that I did was to read or at least flip through every page of the Luthersk Tidenda and the Lutheran Sentinel and every page of the Synod reports for a hundred years because those became the primary sources and all of these direct quotations that are banners in the book had to be found somewhere. So that was a very time consuming element and was a big part of the basic research. Now I've been a lifelong member of the Synod, so the outline was easily in my mind, but it was to fill in those details. There also had to be some considerable work in the Synod archives in order to find those pictures and then some of the original sources referred to in the Sentinels and the Synod reports. And that even involved a visit to Concordia Historical Institute in St. Louis, where they were able to assist me in some of the photographs that we ourselves did not have. So I guess we never really talked about it. Now there was a name change uh, between the Norwegian Synod and going to the ELS. That took place in, in the 1950s, if I'm remembering correctly. How long was Norwegian used in official publications uh, or, or even synod minutes. And obviously you would have to work with, with Norwegian to be able to do a big part of the work. The name change took place in 1957 when it was voted through and it was ratified in 1958. Until then we were the Norwegian Synod of the American Evangelical Lutheran Church. The ethnic part of the name was no longer important and did not serve any purpose. And so the intention was to drop that part of the designation and we became known as the Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Synod was very important because as I mentioned earlier, the old synod often was simply known as the synod. 
the large merger body was known as the Evangelical Lutheran Church. And so you can see what was happening when Evangelical Lutheran Synod was chosen as our name. The early records, yes, are all in Norwegian. At the very first convention, a historical committee was formed to save records. We don't know whatever happened to them. They don't exist. And so some of those early minutes do not exist in formal form. We did have, do have a detailed newspaper account of that very first meeting at Lime Creek that we had professionally translated. But otherwise, even the synod reports were Norwegian language into uh, at least the late 1920s. In 1920, it was printed bilingually in both languages, but that only lasted for one year. The Sentinel and the Tidenda, the publications, continued in both languages. I believe it was into the 1940s that the Tidenda was no longer being printed in Norwegian and then the transition in at least official publications went into the English language itself. I have enough knowledge of the Norwegian language that I can find what I am looking for in these documents themselves. And if I struggle, I can do reading with some of them itself. So I could find the items that I need and then either know I have to do some translating with them or need some assistance with them. So the Norwegian continued for that long and into the 1960s, our synod convention did begin with a synod Sunday service in the Norwegian language. So almost, yeah, about almost half the time Norwegian is still being used. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was obviously a, a one challenge in your, in your research is working with a, a foreign language. Were there some other challenges in, in working on this project? Because of the style of history that this is with all of the photographs, it was finding the missing photographs. You would, there could be a very important story that had to be told, but there had to be an image with it. And so some of those took considerable digging to find them in the right spot itself. And then because the story is also told through the banners containing direct quotations from what was taking place, that required a fairly diligent reading of what was being said right at that point in time to pull those quotations out. And so those were both unique challenges that you would not have in a more general type of a history. So while conducting your research, did you find anything that really surprised or excited you when you came across it? Something that had not been addressed before and I found very interesting was, as was said, when the Norwegian Synod reorganized as the ELS, these were small congregations and small groups. And we would very often hail the faith and the courage of these small groups that left their congregations, left their buildings and reorganized. But we failed to talk about the larger churches that came out as a group, who came out as a whole, who came with their buildings, who came with a whole congregation. They gave a significant boost to that little group of people that said, we're not just a fledgling body, but we're real. We can attract other people. We have real congregations, and those congregations could provide a great deal of strength, both morally and financially, to the small group that came into existence. In the early days, Synod Conventions met in congregations. That's where they were hosted. And very typically, when one of these larger congregations joined, they were the immediately became the hostess congregation. And that's just an aspect that's quite unique that we don't spend enough time talking about. All right, well, thank you for sharing. Now for our final section of the podcast, I'm going to break with our normal procedure. I normally ask you about your personal interests, which if you want to get them in there, you, you're more than welcome to. But um, since you're working- you guessed those already. What was that? I think you've guessed the personal interests already. Yes, I think that's, I don't want to say it's one and the same, but yeah, uh, 
we've, we've seen your passion for the history of your synod. And that being said, I want to just talk about kind of a, a bigger idea of the role of history for the Christian church, or and then how does it play out in, within denominational histories or, or institutional histories? So whenever I, as a pastor, teach or preach on the doctrine of the church, I usually try to emphasize the church is a collection of all believers everywhere of all time. I'm talking about the invisible church. There are clearly blessings and a mission for the present. And of course, we're looking forward to an eternal future. Yet we cannot be quick to pass by the church of the past. And one thing I've noticed about the ELS is that it's very history conscious. It's present day identity cannot be understood without knowing its past. And that's very clear uh, from the foreword in Proclaiming His Wonders. It was written by the recently sainted Synod President John Molstead. He noted that CFW Walther had praised the old Norwegian Synod for being Lutheran, not in name only, but as, quote, this is CFW Walther here, but as a genuine Lutheran church body, you place your pure doctrine above everything and make it your task to bring it forth from the word. Now, President Molstead held nothing back uh, when he said next, this is kind of a lengthier quote, but I'll, I think it's all very important. He said, how quickly things changed. 30 years after Walther's death, the beloved Norwegian Synod unfortunately yielded to error. The compromising merger body was known as the Norwegian Lutheran Church in America, a predecessor of today's ELCA. It is no secret that today's ELCA has spiraled downward in surrendering clear teachings of scripture to placate societal pressures. The old Norwegian synod praised by Walther is a far cry from what today purports to be the legitimate ecclesiastical descendant of that body. He's continued to say, uh, the ELS has its roots in the old Norwegian synod by grace. We regard our synod as the theological successors of such. Now, if someone were to say in response to that quote or, or to the rest of the, the, this book or the project, uh, there are so many problems in the world today. The only way we're going to stop it is if churches forget about a little doctrinal difference and get on with dealing with what really matters to people. Well, how would you respond to a, a statement or a mentality like that with reference to the history of the ELS? Well, first of all, if the church is going to get on with its work, what is that work? And of course, that is proclaiming the gospel of the new good news of salvation in Jesus Christ through his death and his resurrection. And so that is of significant importance in what the work is. The Holy Spirit himself only is going to use the truth of God's word to bring faith and sanctification to individuals' lives. And so it is very important to preserve that truth in such a way that the Holy Spirit may make use of it for the edification of God's people themselves. Doctrinal compromise, as John Molstead pointed out, is only going to lead to just that, a compromise that is not going to further that work of the kingdom of the salvation of souls themselves. And so that's where the answer becomes we can't forget about doctrinal differences and put all of that under the carpet if we are truly going to pursue the work of the church itself and provide the means for the Holy Spirit to use word and sacrament for the spreading of the gospel and the strengthening of souls. So why is understanding a church body's history so important for its current work and for its future as a visible institution? Many people would not think it is that important, and that I think is unfortunate because it is our identity. It's who we are. We, of course, are redeemed sinners, baptized into Christ, justified by him, but this is where he has placed us in the world to work. This history tells us why we do things the way we do them. When I was in the seminary, President Theodore Auberg, and that's who wrote the, the 50th anniversary history, A City Set on a Hill, President Auberg gave us a piece of advice for in the parish ministry. And that is when someone asks you a question about why we do something, you should answer, 
There must be a reason. And then pursue what that reason is. Well, that is the case also for a church body. There must be a reason for why we are where we are, why we do things the way we do them. And it helps explain us in our present day. But also, it's important because history does repeat himself. Satan tests us and has tested church bodies and congregations in many and various ways. And so we need to be aware of those temptations themselves to know that we already have confronted them and emerged victorious, lest we fall victim to them again. And so that history is very important for us yet today. Thank you. That was a very, very good answer. Appreciate that. Now, I noticed uh, just from checking out the, the websites, but also visiting the Bethany Lutheran College and Seminary campuses, that the ELS puts a lot of effort into its anniversaries. So the 100th anniversary was in 2018, but you had just gotten done with the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, and now we're hearing today uh, just you're celebrating another one, the 75th anniversary of the seminary. Why put so much emphasis on anniversaries? What's the benefit in doing so? Part is the small church body, and it speaks of our unity and our family. But more so, this is the communion of saints. This is who we are. This is how we fit into broader, broader Christendom. We are heirs of the Lutheran Reformation. We are heirs of what our forefathers and foremothers did 100 years ago. This is God's working in our midst. And we don't want to forget that it is not our doing, but it's all his. So finally, now with your uh, experience in putting together this pictorial history, what practical advice do you have for Lutherans planning anniversaries of churches, schools, or other institutions? Start early. It will sneak up upon you, and there are many things that will take time, such as the writing of a history, of a book, whatever the case might be. But as those histories are prepared, and as the celebration is prepared, it's important to remember that we're not writing a secular history. It's not the same as a history of a school or a nation, but here we are writing about the acts of God. And so it is more than just dates and buildings. It's God's working. And so in the midst of it, take an opportunity to teach. This is why we exist. This is our purpose. This is why God has placed us here. There was someone that I once read who said, it is so important for a church to celebrate an anniversary because as we think back to our founders and what happened at the beginning, we're not just talking about events, but we're talking about the faith that caused them to establish this congregation. We're talking about the faith that caused them to spend their money and devote their lives to building up the church. Why did they do that? Why did they believe? What's the blessed result of their faith? And that's what's really important. The buildings, the dates, they're only secondary. What is important is why it was done, for whom it was done, and that to God alone be the glory. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Frickenstead, for your, your time today. You're welcome.